Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom? Somebody set us up the bomb. You have no chance. Make your time. All your base are belong to us. My name is Eric, and and that's really the most sense I'm going to be making today. <laughs> do you? Maybe we should just do this entire show in German. Okay. Would that be? I'm here with uh, with Michael. Yeah. By the way, 99% German. And uh, today we're doing Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas and The Third Man. Wait, what? No. I've n- I don't even know what that other movie is. The Third Man? Yeah, never heard of it. But today we're going to cover The Trial and Naked Lunch. That's today? Yeah. I have the, the wrong notes for Double Feature in front of me. Uh, there is no hope for this show. <laughs> we're going to do like... Uh, I'm See, gonna, that's a little Kafka-esque attitude I've got going say, into this. It's kind of like a beginner's guide to Kafka It's th- without the guide part. We're going to spoil both films. <laughs> All right, look, here's the deal. I couldn't spoil these films if I wanted to. I could. I'm not sure I'll get to the ending. I'm not sure I'll get to the beginning of yeah. either of these films. Yeah. If you've seen uh, these films, I would say less than about five to ten yeah. times. Or if you've, if you've read the books. Then we may, we may uh, or if you haven't read the books, rather, we well, may no. spoil it. That's what I was getting to. Well, also, but if you have read the books, you might get Whether spoiled. you've read or not read or seen if or not seen the If you've read the, the movies, books, you need to watch the movies. That's what I'm saying. Oh, good. I was going to say, whether you're familiar with this material at all or not, we may, in fact, spoil it. Yeah, it, or not, that's fine. Really, is yeah. what I'm getting at. Right. You could use chapters. If you're confused at this point, you have no idea what you're in for. Oh, we're going to use some chapters, I guess. You can use the chapters if you want to use the chapters. I guess we start with the trial. Do we start with the trial? We have to start with the trial. Both of these, I mean, this is really a, a great pairing. These movies make each other better. Mm-hmm. They, I don't know that I would say they explain each other better, but they make each other better. I guess we'll just start with the trial, which, by the way, is the 1962 Orson Welles version. The Orson Welles trial. Of with the trial. spoken word credits. <laughs> right. None other. This is also, I know we like to point these out in the rare cases they happen, but this is a public domain film. Huh. So let me tell you what I like about the trial as a movie before we get into the Kafka. Are you ready? Yeah, please. Uh, I like the score. I like the score quite uh-huh. a bit. I think it's a, a depressingly just fucking perfect score. I mean, particularly the theme, maybe not uh, so much as the, the score and the chase piano and the yep. strange bass, mm-hmm. uh, but I really like the theme at the beginning and the voiceover credits. Yeah. If I were Orson Welles, I would be reading all my credits. Yeah. I would be reading my scripts over <laughs> the actors. I would dub out the actors and dub in me <laughs> reading the scripts. So we have Orson Welles writing and directing the film, yeah. as he announces at the end. We talked about him a little bit on uh, on the show before when we did Touch of Evil. Right. The film noir that he was in uh, also directed that. And so this is, I think this is officially two. I think at this point he shows up on the Double Feature website as directors you might need to read two paragraphs about. Huh. Do you want to go ahead and write those two paragraphs? or I could really... try, but I, I don't know anything. I haven't even seen Citizen Kane. I don't know anything about... Orson Welles. I'm not even going to touch Citizen Kane on this show because we'll get we'll get off on this entire other thing. And Anthony Perkins is also that, yeah from the the stabby shower re, re, psycho. That's what's called. You were only going to give it one sound. Well, I interrupted myself with my own knowledge. Something that may happen a lot <laughs> on today's show. Did you just get knowledge bombed? Is that yeah, what happened? I knowledge bombed myself. Anthony Perkins is great in this. He's yeah. got some really good moments in this. So I'm going to admit something to you uh, right now, which is going to be infinitely amusing. Amusing upon itself into an infinite loop that spirals downward into a third dimension of darkness. Uh, I'm totally new to Kafka. Huh. A hundred percent. Really? You weren't prepared for this. No, I wasn't. Not at all. I know nothing about Kafka. I know a little, a little tiny bit. Yeah. Um, I've never read any Kafka. Wow. I've, this is what I know is that, um, it was a German writer, right? Mm-hmm. And I know that um, grammar and syntax were an interesting part of his work, mm-hmm. so much so that I've always been confused about how I should get into it. Yeah. Because I know he will write these, 
you know, page long sentences where right. the verb because Absolutely. of German syntax shows up at the end. Yeah. And, and that, I mean, his writing style is so interesting to me mm -hmm. that I've always wanted to find some way to, to be honest with you, I've told myself in the back of my head, yeah. oh, I'm just going to go ahead and learn German yeah. and then I will yeah. read good. That's well, not going to happen. The thing, the thing that, uh, that probably makes Kafka a lot more approachable once I say this to you and I'm about to drop a knowledge bomb on you, <laughs> he's written two books. Sweet. That's it. He's what written are you talking two, about books. two books. I don't even believe you. He's written two books and like half of a third one that was then completed after he died. Well, yeah, I know a lot of his stuff came out basically after he died. Right. So is it a short stories beyond wrote, that? Or yeah, what? it's mostly short stories and clippings. Okay. He did the Metamorphosis. Great. In which see now I'm this is exciting <laughs> for me. You know what? Actually, how about we close? the uh trial section of today's show by me discussing the metamorphosis <laughs> everybody Great. who knows what happens in the metamorphosis and watched naked lunch is laughing their ass off right oh, now i hate you but the trial is i mean the trial is the big kafka sure book and it's also absolutely picturesque of what kafka is which is bleak miserable hopeless and just everybody's against you right. 100% of the time. Sure. Would you call that picturesque or Kafkaesque? The term, can we talk a little bit about the we, term Kafkaesque? We need to talk about the term Kafkaesque, I guess. The real majority of what I know about uh, Franz Kafka. Is Breaking Bad, from season <laughs> three, episode three. Wow. Well done. Thank you. Very well done. Uh, it's, it's very humorous. <laughs> I mean, to throw, I noticed that you have dropped the term Kafkaesque. I want to say at least once on our show. Probably, I think sometimes you put it in as a joke, and I, I added it's it half a joke. But it, the thing is, the other what's the other option, right? I can say the word Kafka esque, sure, or I can say bleak, hopeless, confusing, <laughs> and everyone hates you. <laughs> right? It's uh, you know, it's when things are complicated. It's when things are. I associate it with the word disorienting. Yeah, all well, the time. yeah. Well, when I, things are so disorienting, it seems hopeless or it seems dangerous, mm -hmm. even more so. You don't know what's going on, but you know that it's bad and you should get away from yeah, it. Yeah, I mean that's another. But it's claustrophobic, so yeah. you can't. You're trapped right. within the disorienting madness. Yeah. I mean, it's really the the, the term exists, mm -hmm. not so much because maybe partially because Kafka is known for this stuff. Sure. And so you go back to that and the way you say something like Hitchcockian or Adam Greenian or no one says that. Right. People should start saying that. I believe it's called Greenlandish. But more because it's a very, very distinct style of maybe not of writing, but just this thing that exists and there is no other word for it. Uh -huh. When you are so disoriented that the looming sense of danger is uh, really the pinnacle of what it could possibly be yeah. because of that. These, I'm having trouble even well, describing it, it outside of, of... A lot of it comes from being in a position where you are infinitely vulnerable. There you are, infinitely vulnerable. And Perfect. that's really what... I mean, this film is about... It's about being put in a situation where you never get the chance to stand up and defend what's sure. going on around you. Sure. It starts with this guy, Joseph K., mm -hmm. being woken up in bed, and he's immediately arrested. Sure. For what? He never finds out. <laughs> right. Yeah. It, well, that's not how it starts. It starts with before the law. It starts with a fucking parable. That's true. Which I'm, I promise myself, and I will make this promise now to you, that I will spend no more than a minute trying to dissect a parable that has not been solved in centuries. Okay. Would it be centuries? How, how, what are we talking for Kafka? Is, how old is this stuff? Oh, I don't know. Probably. Long time. Yeah, long time. <laughs> we have no idea. Yeah. We have Carriage, absolutely Carriages. No Carol what? Carriages. Uh, it's like a samurai stroller, but horses pull it and adults ride in it. So there were carriages back then. Our, producer, okay. our producer is flagging us. She woke up. This is the first time. Hey, uh, we're on year four, producer. Good. Kafka, anything? 1925, 1925. I'm getting. 1925. Okay. <laughs> that <laughs> seems stunningly accurate. <laughs> you will no longer be necessary for the rest of the year. Thank you. 19, okay, so 1925 is 1925, the year. carriages or not. Bear or no bear, <laughs> Kafka wrote the trial. <laughs> oh, my God. The other part of that style is surrealism. Oh, yeah. I mean, when you think about, okay, remember we covered, um, uh, we were just talking about Psycho, we covered it with Lost Highway. Yeah. That's yes. something that may border on Kafka's. Brazil, certainly. Uh, sure. 
you know, Lost Highway, I think for me, just because that sense of danger is right. really high. And the disorienting is, it's on the verge of understandable, mm-hmm. which is a really interesting place to be because you get a feeling this should be approachable to you. Whereas these movies today, I look at them and I think it, they're, the point is to be, not sure. to be approachable. Jarring. It's, it's supposed to take you out of your comfort zone. So I struggle for the first half and then I surrender and I just yeah. give up. Whereas something like Lost Highway, I feel like I'm always on the edge of knowing it. Well, that's really what the trial is about. The trial is about how long somebody will struggle before they just accept... <laughs> sure. That whatever happened to them, they're they're done. They have to give up. Right, sure. That's what the film is about. This guy wakes up one morning, is accused of a crime, and it's just about how long he's willing to fight a behemoth of an impenetrable system sure, sure. before he just gives up, accepts that he's guilty, or kills himself. <laughs> right. Well, that opening is incredibly stressful. Yeah, uh, you it pointed is. that it's, out as we were watching. I mean, it's insane. Low ceilings, big doors. This well, and guy, who are these people? They just show up out of nowhere. And he never gets. He's he has to put clothes on with someone watching him. Sure, there's all these people in and around his apartment. It's and so he, overwhelming, and he has yeah. no idea what's going on. And and it's just early in the morning. Sure, it's waking up in Dark City. Yeah, yeah, right? and not knowing what the fuck is happening and trying to you know regain your footing. Except you will never, that footing will only come more and more. When you were asleep, that was the best grip you had sure. on reality for sure. essentially the rest of his life. Right. Right. Well, yeah. And and the thing that's really, really interesting about the story of the trial and the film, just the way the film does it is perfect, mm-hmm. is that there are glimmers where it seems like Kay is finally going to get a break. Sure. He knows somebody that knows a really good advocate that can talk to the court system, or he finds out that there's a painter that has a ton of influence with the judges. And he gets there and realizes that even their reach of influence doesn't go to the top. Right. And essentially, he is just too far limited in his understanding. He's out of his depth immediately. Right. And he is doomed. His only skill set from there is to deal with ambiguity. Right. He, yeah. he simply has to become accustomed to this being the way things sure. are and try and find very practical, immediate uh, solutions right. to symptoms rather than to problems. Right. Which you would think would be open one of the law books, accustom yourself to what's going on, and uh, see Betty Page's vagina. That might not be where I go for that, but sure, that's one possible solution. So we get Orson Welles reading this uh, parable, which oh, is right. already distracting me because, as, as is obvious, I love Orson Welles' radio voice. Uh-huh. And so uh, I'm trying very hard, especially alongside Naked Lunch. I know I'm, I'm in for a bit of uh-huh. a ride here. Naked Lunch I've seen before. Yeah. The trial I had not. And so I'm really honed in. I am ultimately committed to understanding this parable. And uh, what... <laughs> so, I mean, I'm not really sure where to begin on this. Probably at the ending, which is to just close the book on this one and leave it alone. Right. But that's too safe. Let's do something dangerous and let's just poke at this a bit. Um, Kafka writes this thing before the law. They include it at the beginning of the trial. I guess it's called before the law because they talk about that in the trial. Uh-huh. I'm just trying to make it more Googleable for people. What? Yeah, I don't know. It's, <laughs> okay. it's that's what I assume. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's really it's this weird, complex story of a guy who needs to go through a bunch of gates, sure. and the guard tells him that he's the guard of the gate, and so the guy gets old and dies, and then the guard pulls a you know a mind freak on him, yeah, and says, "This was your gate. You're the only one that could go through here." What the fuck? And then he says, "Now I'm going to close it." See, what is bizarre to me is that this is only made complex by attempting to understand it as if it's a parable. Right. You know, it's finding something scribbled in the sand and looking for meaning where it may possibly not be there. Right. The parable, or whatever, let's just call it a fucking story at Mm -hmm. this point. The anecdote, uh, it's hard to call it an anecdote, too, because it's a man's entire life he's waiting. Right. This epic anecdote (laughs) that is delivered by Orson Welles, totally fine description, is incredibly simple a man is waiting Uh and he's like what the fuck let me in and the guy's like uh maybe we'll see what happens and then he dies waiting turns out he couldn't get in 
But that door that he was waiting on, only he could get into that door. Yeah. There's no real paradox here. There just aren't enough clues to figure out what the fuck this is supposed to yeah. mean. Yeah, I mean, maybe if we were there, maybe if uh, we had some CSI Miami work. Maybe if there were 20 extra pages of this story yeah. that were left out, <laughs> right? And ultimately, the real frustration here is uh, almost a meta layer. It's the, the mere fact that we're attempting to interpret sure. something that may have been created just to frustrate people who attempt to interpret it. Well, it... it- it ki- it could be construed as just something to open you up to being confused before the confusion sets in. Right. So I'm going to give people something incredibly digestible from uh, a really heavy literary work, one that is near and dear to my heart and that inevitably we'll find on the show at some point. In Atlas Shrugged, there's uh-huh. a phrase for this very thing. Uh-huh. The phrase is, who is John Galt? Now that phrase means a lot of things for a lot of different reasons. But, you know, the way you're at least introduced to this phrase is it's asking a question, you know, why ask why? What is even the point? Who is John Galt? And so I look at this, and that's the way I can contain it, seal it off, quarantine (laughs) it in my brain. I can look at this and I can say, oh, totally approachable. Who is John Galt? Yeah. Why are we even talking about this? And so we move on. (laughs) So if I can return to the the Hitchcock, the psycho thing for just a minute. We talked about Hitchcock having this idea of a MacGuffin. Mm -hmm. And so when I look at the trial, it seems to me to to be very similar. You could look at it in the same way as a MacGuffin. Whereas a MacGuffin was the briefcase in Pulp Fiction. It's the fucking Maltese Falcon. It's something that drives your plot. The item itself doesn't really matter. It could be a bullshit item. It could be something called the MacGuffin. Right. It doesn't matter. You move your plot forward using this item. Here, that item is the plot itself. This is a premise without an actual premise. (laughs) That's the premise, is that there's no premise. Except for the fact that I think that one of the biggest driving factors for me Mm -hmm. with the trial is... And and Anthony Perkins was perfect for it. I couldn't tell if he was a bad guy. Right. The whole (laughs) time, I'm wondering if he is innocent... Or if he's did guilty, he how bad did he... Wow, that's an interesting actually, question, too. You know what I mean? Yeah. He never... He doesn't come off as a particularly fantastically clean human being, and we don't even know what kind of gradient this court is operating on. Sure. It could even be an ethical court right. where it's just based on whether or not he's been kind to his parents in the past 10 years. Sure. Well, this is the going back to the dealing with ambiguity idea. Yeah, right. You will fight yourself for the entire movie going, well, hold on, we can't answer that question yet. We don't even know what's being asked. Sure. And the movie just is is really preparing you to throw answers at yeah. a question that well, hasn't been asked yet. Yeah, That's I the think, only way you progress. I think the answer to the movie is dynamite. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Thanks, dynamite. It certainly is. But I'm amazed how far you actually get without having any origin of the problem. Sure. Yeah. You know, I mean, the problem is that there's a problem. Yeah. But you see a man descend into madness. He's making companions along the way. He's forming strategy. He's planning. He's trying to solve a mystery. He's fighting a fucking enemy, although the real enemy is unknown. Group of little girls. When you're talking about the emotional... Oh my God, will we get there? When you're talking about the emotional kind of beats of a story or of a character, they're all here. Yeah. We just don't really know what's driving them. In fact, it may not even be important. We have clearly an entire movie. We don't know the driving force. A whopper of a two-hour film. A two-hour film where we're not really sure what we're trying to accomplish, but we are running at it as fast as possible. I mean, I guess that's not true. We know what we're trying to accomplish. We're trying to prove innocence. We're not really sure why, but I'm amazed how far you can go. I mean, really, you can go the entire way. You have an entire film without ever making that point. It's really just an argument against exposition. We are willing to go along with the movie, even if we're not really sure what we're going along for. That makes the premise as an independent entity itself fucking with the protagonist. (laughs) The premise really eventually becomes the antagonist of the film. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's the thing driving Joseph K. insane. It's the thing forcing him to create these unlikely alliances. Yeah. And eventually, he becomes physically disoriented by Mm -hmm. it, which is great. You know, you think of a term Kafkaesque as being about the horror of uh, caused by that disorientation. Mm -hmm. And you're really seeing that physically manifested here. He is actually disoriented by how this is, you know, causing him to unwind. 
So all of that, I mean, I, it, just listening to this conversation must be as painful for people as trying as to watching the, the trial. Well, it's trying to, to decipher. Oh, I'm not okay. going to say it's watching the trial. No. Well, that's mean, but you know what I mean. It's yeah, trying to. I was just giving you a hard time trying to decipher it. There's a you know an overall uh, sense of Being surrealism surrounded by little girls. But well, that's that's what I wanted to talk about. Actually, okay. all right. I think that's heightened in the scene. You know, with this uh, painter, uh-huh. right? It, when they're in the weird shack, there's all the cracks of light. The children are peering in. It's the most stressful thing yeah. since the beginning of the yep, film. It's, it's, it's fucking maddening. To watch this kind of madness portrayed on screen is incredible. Mm-hmm. I can't believe the the effect it has on the audience, specifically from the time period. Yeah. To think that, you know, Orson Welles always talks about how he thinks The Trial is his best movie and he's all sad pants that nobody else liked it. I'm amazed the effect. It must have just repulsed people. I yeah. mean, that's all I can imagine. It must have just been like walking into a strobe light. It's Yeah, it was too much for people yeah. at the time. They couldn't fucking handle it. I want to say that scene embodies everything the movie's about, but it, it really does it more so than I think... It embodies where you end up when you try sure. deciphering what the fuck is going on. Yeah. That's the mental place it puts you in. I, you know, when they end that scene, he's running through this hallway of thin boards being chased. I mean, it's really an incredible scene. Yeah. It's visually really, really stunning, and it's, it's well-placed. It's uh, not a scene without purpose. Right. You need Orson fucking Wells to deliver the madness, and this is what it looks <laughs> like, and it's amazing. I, the sets throughout this entire movie are one of the things that I think makes it notable outside of all of the crazy shit we've been trying to talk about. You have that low ceiling apartment. Yeah. You know, you have this uh, these different rooms that just call for weird angles and weird camera work. But you also have, in stark contrast to that, these hugely expansive... Well, like where he works. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You know, these kind of utilitarian... Almost reminds me of something out of Equilibrium. Yeah. You know, the... Yeah. The ton of the subway stuff they used there for the place he worked. You have the vast number of you know lights and desks and the people. Uh, that's really overwhelming too. You feel you just got out of this claustrophobic environment, so you feel a little bit of air. You feel a little bit of freedom. You can kind of spread your limbs out a little bit. But then also the number of people there driving in synchronous constant rhythm it's really overwhelming it reminds me i I don't know if you remember i don't follow the olympics well enough if it was the last olympics or the one before or my memory is also terrible but it's the same thing a lot of people said about china Uh they hadn't been exposed to something as powerful as this before and they saw the kind of uh chinese orchestration of the opening of the olympics and it terrified people (laughs) and people couldn't quite put their finger on why there were just so many of them and they were perfectly in sync and the things they were doing, it almost triggers this sort of, uh, you know, when you hear a lion roar, yeah. the kind of thing your body does where it says, oh, danger, get out. Right. That's the thing you're seeing in the trial, especially when they all start to move abruptly, when it's time to get off work yeah. and everyone gets up at the exact same fucking time. There's a, a feeling of panic in me. I can't even imagine what it w- would have been like being on a set that big where everybody, like you're going to be stampeded or something. Right. There's a ton of people in the sort of trial room sure. that they're all in, the or the hearing. farce trial, or the yeah. hearing, or whatever the fuck is happening there. The camera's kind of out among the crowd, which is, I mean, there's something really kind of bizarre, especially for that time period. You see that a little bit more now, where you have a big crowd and event going on, the camera tries to kind of put you in that place. We even saw that a little bit during some of the Rocky stuff. Yeah. But to have a camera positioned as if it's another head amongst a crowd like that, right? is something unusual for dealing with a, a film from the 60s. The lighting's something to note throughout the movie, too. Although I don't think anything deserves to be talked about more than the lighting in that sort of library file area. Yeah. Where he first meets the character that Orson Welles is playing. Right. His lawyer slash... What's the advocate, term they, use for they keep calling him an advocate, but yeah. basically he's kind of like a... He's a cheater lawyer. He's the sickly man in bed who might help you, maybe. Yeah. And when the lightning starts in that area, yeah. and just the wide open kind of roof, it, it looks like they haven't even finished construction or something. And there's tons of panels firing, you know, light panels from all over the place overhead. Yeah. 
it's another one of those things where it's so many components going all at once, attempting to overwhelm the senses. Uh, it's really an incredible look. So what's this metamorphosis thing? Okay. I'm scared. So right before we get into Naked Lunch, and uh, I, I promise you this is going to roll us in remarkably well. So the other really famous Kafka work is called The Metamorphosis. It's really similar to The Trial in that it's about a guy who wakes up in a shitty situation and then, I, well, I'm not going to spoil the ending, but it's Kafka-esque. Um, <laughs> I hate you. Basically, what happens is he wakes up one morning and he is a giant beetle. So moving into <laughs> Naked Lunch. Oh, my God. Oh, uh... I, you know, the reputation of this movie needs to be discussed, if only briefly. Yeah. Sometimes uh, people might sort of tune into the show. They download a couple movies. They're not aware that The Room is The Room right. or that <laughs> Rocky Horror has some legacy sure. or that people talk about. I mean, Naked or that Lunch Kidman is... Cruz. <laughs> sure. What was that? Kidman Cruz Kubrick? Yeah, right. This is one of those movies. First of all, it's one of the books that everybody said you can't make into a movie. Uh -huh. Right. That's sort sure. of the thing. Like the Bible. <laughs> Uh, only because it would bore the shit out of the people. I can't wait till the second act with all the begots. That's really my favorite part. That would just be a porno. Be very similar to Caligula. All this begetting and uh, after begetting fluid. Shapes, Michael. We start with shapes. There are shapes all around us. Colors. This is really the last time the film makes sense to me, is okay. when there are shapes on the screen <laughs> in the opening. <laughs> You know, the strange thing happened to me watching this movie again. Uh -huh. And we actually watched these in reverse order. Yeah, I, I don't know why, but I we don't either. Did. But uh, the strange thing did happen while watching Naked Lunch this time in that I understood it 100%. Yeah. I just couldn't relate in yeah. the slightest. <laughs> and I think that's usually you see something surreal and it's not meant to be understood. Right. And it throws you off of itself. Yeah. And uh, and you come away going, what the fuck happened there? Sure. And most people probably have that reaction to Naked Lunch, and that's totally fair. Yeah. However, I felt like, yep, totally got what they were doing yeah. there. I cannot relate to any of those yeah, things. Yeah, I really, really love Naked Lunch. It's possible that Naked Lunch is my favorite David Cronenberg movie. Yeah, man, doing drugs and breaking other people's typewriters. I totally yeah. get why you like this film. <laughs> the remains of my uh, my last writing machine, hauling your bag of drugs around. Yeah. I mean, it's almost like a road film, yeah, sort of. It's really, I think... You and a bag of drugs hit the road. <laughs> sure. If nothing else. There may but be no road, is, but there is certainly a trip. This is interesting. Uh, coming from you, who has, I believe, never done a recreational drug in your never entire in life. Never in my goddamn life. I, I can almost say the same thing. I've had alcohol before. Is that, you're still Zero on the no? Zero percent alcohol. No alcohol. So most of the time that I see films with a heavy drug component, I think they're probably made for that audience. Uh -huh. Not the case with you. No. You love this film, never done a drug in your life. Yeah, I adore it. I think it's a great film. I blame William S. Burroughs. Who is that, by the way? William S. Burroughs. Okay, so I guess we we should have decided this at the beginning. I guess we'll we'll make a bigger bigger note about it in the closing here. But both of these are very famous books. Excellent. Uh, William S. Burroughs wrote Naked Lunch. He was a total fucking drugged out, sure hippie, crazy motherfucker. And there, I don't know how true it is, but I have heard from many sources that he didn't even know he wrote this book. <laughs> He sure. saw it on a shelf somewhere sure. and saw his name and his picture and the, about the author. Right. And the picture was just a mugwump, I believe. But he just, I don't know what goes on in this, went on in this man's head. Yeah. I don't know much about his personal life, but I know that it can't be normal. I want to talk about the beginning and the end of this guy's life or uh, as a writer at sure. least, or maybe that's not even accurate. I'm going to talk about two events that are weird to me. The first is that he kills his wife, right? Okay. So this is real. This is real. This William is real Burroughs? life. This okay. Is, this is not the dentist, Michael. This is real life. Is this going to be forever? He kills his wife and there's some fleeing to Mexico. You know, it's weird enough that he, I believe he fled to Mexico from Louisiana to escape some other crime. Mm -hmm. While in Louisiana, he kills his common law wife uh, by accident, I guess. By drunken, stupid accident. You know what's amazing? He kills her doing the William Tell routine. Okay. So uh, <laughs> they're at some drunken party or something and attempts to do this and he kills her. So yeah. he flees once again, hoping to, you know, avoid legal penalty for this. 
ends up getting convicted for two years, which are suspended. Wow. And this is what starts his writing career. Okay. This is what inspires <laughs> him to begin writing. So Naked Lunch, the film, is a little less of the book. Oh, it's, it's a lot less. But it is a lot of uh, his other works and his, you yeah. know, his own life. Yeah. See, the thing about Naked Lunch, the film, and versus Naked Lunch, the book, mm. is they're not the same thing. Sure. I'm sure one is inspired by the other. I, I've read Naked Lunch. As much as you can read. There's no I heard s- that you can read it completely out of order and that yeah. the author well, the intended thing, this. The thing about Naked Lunch is there's not really a cohesive story. Beautiful. Characters flop around, bull dykes rip dildos in half with their muscular vaginas. Sure. I mean, this is this is what goes on in the book. The things that really happen, there's a lot of inanimate objects having sex with things sure i mean there's a lot of sexually subversive literature would you say well maybe but i don't know what it's subverting i'm not sure (laughs) Sure. not sure where in human social culture we ever went typewriters should not fuck like people right right uh but the thing is is i i can tell from what i know of william s burrow's life and now from what i know from what you just told me that it's it's close it's almost like William S. Burroughs' brain making a biopic of itself. Sure. Yeah, I can see that. A kind of autobiography that was not actually put together by the author. Yeah. What a fucking amazing idea. Bravo, David Cronenberg. I know we're not going to get to a lot of Cronenberg yeah. here, and we've done a lot of Cronenberg before, but bravo, David Cronenberg. Absolutely. A weird fucking idea for a weird fucking guy. So the other thing I want to talk about is he dies of a heart attack. Oh, Okay. It, yeah, this seems like such... I mean, it's weird when you meet these people and they have such immortal lives and such mortal deaths. Yeah. They live a, a drug-induced fantasy and, uh, you know, the stuff they write is so bizarre. They are... It's beyond larger than life. It's... I guess it's not of this world is yeah. the, the phrase you'd probably use for mm-hmm. something like that. And when you die by something as grounded as a heart attack... It's so weird to it, bring them it, in their last yeah. instant back to humanity. Right, right. This is something that old, boring people die of. Heart attacks. Anybody can. We could die of a heart attack right now on the show. Yep. Normal, mere mortals die of heart attacks. Drug psycho rock stars die of, I don't know, being eaten alive by their own books or something. Yeah. They don't go out this right. way. So the surrealism of this film does not uh, damage the protagonist in the same way as the last film. Right, not at all. We talked a lot about the trial being about madness. Mm-hmm. You know, that word came up a lot. But here, our protagonist keeps relatively cool about this. Yeah, well, the thing that's really strange is this movie came out in, I believe, the 80s. It was, I think it's 91. It came out in the early 90s then. Yeah. Way before hipster culture. Sure. Way before it was, well, actually, right at the advent of it being cool not to care. Okay. And we have this character. He's easily one of my favorite protagonists in film. Sure. Uh, He uh, gets put in a situation where a giant bug's back vagina is asking him to rub drugs on it. Okay. Why not? And he just sits there and uh, he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> right. Right, it doesn't bother him. Yeah. And this should be the beginning of his, you know, descent into mm-hmm. madness. This should be all right. I'm going to start trying the drugs that I've been, you know, I get the impression that he doesn't do drugs or hasn't he done drugs. Sta- he hasn't started. Right. He didn't start doing drugs. He just eventually is doing drugs. Yeah, is which, doing drugs. Which I think is a brilliant tactic of the film is that you never see him start doing drugs. It's just that eventually he is doing drugs and he kind of wants to stop and ends up getting into harder and harder stuff. It's really kind of like Scanner Darkly where sure. there's just a lot of drug induced. about Philip K. Dick. Being yeah, yeah exactly. Himself Philip K. Too. Dick, William S. Burroughs. It's one murder short of the same guy. These are drugs. I mean, I've never even heard of. That's the kind of drugs this author was doing. They're, well, oh. and I think that's it's paralleled in the movie with drugs that people probably don't yeah. actually do. Oh, uh, what is it? Bug powder? Brazilian People could do aquatic bug centipede. I don't. I don't know. And if, mugwump jism. My point. Oh, my point was that he's comfortable there uh-huh. in the mugwump jism. But I did want to talk about the the unveiling of the mugwump too, because uh, from a technical perspective, if I could move into completely comfortable territory for uh-huh. just a second, if okay. everyone would excuse that, we'll get back into. So the you're gonna room. slide yourself artfully into the parrot cage. The only way in or out of the parrot cage is sliding. So you might as well do it artfully. <laughs> No one has any idea what we're talking about. 
They should. They saw the film, Parent yeah, Cage. They yeah. can put it together. Yeah. It's fine. I'll leave it in. When the Mugwump is initially revealed, it's done in this great way where you don't notice it because it's outside of the depth of field. Mm -hmm. The depth of field is the area that is in focus. Right. Not necessarily the focal point, but at least the area that you can see. Mm -hmm. Outside the depth of field, things are blurred in the background. It gives you that soft background, sharp subject. The subject is inside the depth of field. They are usually the point of focus. Yeah, and in this particular scene, the subject is weird. It seems completely tame by comparison to what happens right, in right. the progression of the scene, but he's kind of this strange, baby-faced, sexually ambiguous David Bowie type sure. guy. Kind of intense, who, but in a smooth who, way. You're not really sure why. He's just asking if he's a faggot or yeah. if he would decide to be a faggot. Sure. And then just says, you should meet my friend here. Yeah. And so he leans back and the focal point shifts. And changes to the mugwump. And you think, that guy couldn't have possibly been here the whole time. They cut away, they cut back, and when they cut back, he's sitting you know, behind. Sitting there licking the... Without fail, I have to check yep. every time. But he's always sitting there, the entire conversation. He's not completely covered. You could see there's some weird... You see his tongue and, the, and, the, thing. and the, yeah. the jism tentacles. <laughs> right. So it uses an existing mechanic we've all seen in nearly every film where part of a frame is in focus, uh, usually the foreground, and part of it is out of focus. And that's all we're doing here. But we're hiding something partially concealed by a man, but mostly just concealed out of the point of focus. It says something great about this camera technique, that it really does draw your eye to a particular part yeah. of a frame. You can include a lot of things in your frame, keeping them out of the depth of field, keeping them out of the point of focus giving you a kind of sense of your context, your surroundings. You know where you are. You get a vague idea. You're in a bar. There's people there. But you know what your eye's supposed to look at because it's in focus. Sure. Here, that's used as a fucking magic trick, and I love it. It's awesome. The only other thing I want to talk about is this red car scene where they're driving in the car. Okay. Uh, we've talked a couple times about shooting in cars and how to do that, and uh, this is really one of my favorite types, and I haven't really noticed it being used a lot since I was made aware of how to do it. Mm -hmm. But it's the least work and one of the best looks. It looks the most authentic. You don't feel like you're you know, on a stage, on a green screen, whatever. And it's simply the way they do this is they light what's inside the car, and you don't light what's outside the car. You black out the outside of the vehicle. And so you just have your camera moving around a little bit. You can be in a stationary vehicle. It gives the illusion of movement. And then you actually move your lights outside the car. So this really only works when you're trying to give the implication that it's nighttime uh -huh. outside. And they do that in this movie. They kind of cut to what's outside the car a couple times, cut to what's back in. But the windows are mostly dark. You can't see what's happening mm -hmm. outside the windows. So there's not a lot to, I mean, there's really nothing to fake with CGI. Right. Right. No There's lawnmower. nothing that won't hold up over time. Right. There's no lawnmower magic. No lawnmower magic, yes. So then what you do is you move these lights outside the car to make the lighting inside change a little bit. To imply, you know, they're coming up to a stoplight. Here's a red light that passes by their face. Here's a green light that passes over there. You know, as you're driving around the street, obviously there would be a lot of different lights outside. So the light that's reflecting on the characters is a little different. And then you can kind of move some out-of-focus lights in the background, and in the reflection of the dashboard. And suddenly, with a bunch of people running around, you could probably do this with a crew of maybe four people and do mm -hmm. a really good job, you know, just outside the vehicle. A couple people waving some stuff in front of lights and moving the lights around, yeah. and a couple other people sort of walking around the car with these different lights to give the illusion that you're actually driving. It's a really clever technique. I just like it a lot. This has made too much sense. Let's move back into <laughs> crazy talk. One of the things that's really bizarre about Naked Lunch, the one thing that's, I mean, everything else. Pretty, just one, just yeah, one. Is that it's supposed to take place in the 50s. Sure. That's it would appear of, so anyways, yeah. right? Well, and one of the things I really love about it is that that's probably more like the 50s than a lot of movies that, quote, take place in the 50s. Sure. People are still normal human beings. They act like people. They're not all happy, having a great time, nine to five jobbers. They do drugs. They this have, isn't the '50s uh, clean house, right? Stepford wife, you know, myth. It's the goddamn human beings in the '50s. 
still doing drugs, still homoeroticism. A lot yeah. of homoeroticism on the show today, yeah. too. I'm yeah. wondering if that's another Kafka thing. It might just be a William S. Burroughs thing. Right. But the thing that's great about the 50s is that it allows for typewriters. Yeah. Which, right. uh, apparently, and now in my head, I don't see a typewriter and go, that could be a wonderfully horrifying creation. Sure. Apparently, David Cronenberg feels the other way about it. Yeah. You know, we've talked about him doing some body horror stuff. Sure. With the fly. Yeah. We talked about on the fly. Um, you know, scanners had a little bit of that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Videodrome is big on it. Sure. And I don't think we're completely leaving that behind in this movie. Although it's more applying some of the concepts of body horror instead to this guy's mind. Yeah. Or just to the, the idea of the mind in general. If that's not getting already way too heavy, no one has any idea what I'm talking about. Does that kind of make sense, though? No, it makes perfect sense. I mean, he's not transforming so much as he's just in and out. Right. And that's the nature of the mechanism. That's sure. the nature of chemicals. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's either on drugs or he's coming off his high and coming back into the real world. Right. So that mental environment is part of the body horror. It's just shutting itself on and off rather than slowly decaying like we see in something like The Fly. That's just in the path we're taking, though. We're still getting the aesthetic of body horror very much so in the visual manifestations of Mm -hmm. the mind in the typewriters being bugs and a lot of the graphic stuff that you've described. I think, you know, you couldn't possibly remove this film completely from Cronenberg's body stuff just because of centipede fucking gay male prostitute in a pair. That's exactly what I was. That's exactly what I was getting. I mean, that's if there's a body horror scene in this film, that's it, right? Yeah. But it really delivers to the point. Well, I guess there's a scene where, uh, Fidella rips herself open and it turns out it's the guy from uh, MASH or whatever, whoever that guy was. Well, that's not a whole lot different than Mission Impossible. It that's just true. happens to have tits. Yeah, happens to have tits. Just like most double features, <laughs> they just happen to have tits. I mean, I feel like that one scene itself, just the the scene in the cave, you have such a good way of describing yeah. it. What is it? It's the centipede fucking a male prostitute in a parrot cage. That scene. Not a fear of saying it, just the inability yep. for it to <laughs> something parrot, uh, sliding man, yeah. gay sex, something. Yeah, it just rolls off the tongue if you're familiar with it. I won't ask. If you were to start compiling a list or uh, you know, a, a kind of a demo reel of the best David Cronenberg body horror stuff, mm-hmm. or even just the best body horror stuff in yeah. general, this is one of the more bizarre. Yeah. I mean, this has to go in the real. Oh, absolutely. This, this demands its own inclusion. It's true. All right. We made it out alive. Um, next on the show. Is, next on the uh, show. You know, before we even get into that, I need, um, we've been talking about a lot of the stuff that's on the website. Right. The entire reason that I rebuilt this website is so we could put more stuff on it more easily. Right. That it would be easier to go in there and just say, you know what? This would be a great idea, wouldn't it? Let's just put that in the website. And the old website basically took, uh, it was impossible. Yeah. Let's just say it was, it was slightly short of impossible to do that. <laughs> new website, it's really easy to make new features and put Great. stuff into it, depending on how crazy the features right. are. So I want to know, doublefeatureshow.com is the site. What should go on there? All right. What do people want to see? What would make you visit the site more? What would basically make the site a more valid place on the internet? Uh Our initial concern was there is no, we are taking up way more space on the internet than we deserve. We want to change that. What do you want to see on the site? Send me some ideas. Um, Send both of us some goddamn ideas. And you'll read the good ones and then make me do them. (laughs) Sounds like a good idea. Double feature show at gmail.com. What are we doing next time? Uh, Next time we're going to, we're going to give people a little bit of a, But we're going to lay off the confusing what the fuck is happening. Thank fuck. But we're going to turn up the high gear on the body horror. The Toxic Avenger. Good. And? Troll 2. This is going to be... This will be a rough day for me on Double Feature. We'll see if I can get through the entire show without throwing up. Okay, that sounds like a great plan. Watch more fucking film. Bye.